Thank you. <laughs> so if your life were turned into a story, would you go pay 80 Hong Kong dollars to go watch it? Or do you think that your life story is the material for like a good plot? Just remember, you have one story to live. You, have, you don't have a real, real do, do button. So you only have one life, one story to write in your life. And so how do we not waste it? How do we write a good story with our lives? I mean, with the EA, with our organization Power Asia, that's what we're all about. We want to help young people write a better story with their lives. And what we believe a good story makes, what it, what it makes to be a good story, and, and how you can help other people to write a better story, that's what I want to talk about. I mean, look at Ted. Ted is a melting pot of creatives, of innovators, of uh, educators, of teachers, of all kinds of people uh, that have an inspiring story, that have stepped out of the ordinary to actually look into what is an inspiring story for me and, and for others. And the reason why we're here today is to actually hear something fresh. That's the topic of the, the TED Global. So, yeah, how can you add like this fresh spin uh, to your own story? I mean, like, to be honest, most of the stories aren't that fresh. Most of our lives are more like a routine. It's writing the mundane chapters of our lives. Like, think of a movie. In a movie, you find the whole life story of the main character condensed in like this two hours, like all the highlights pull all together. Like you don't watch a movie and then you see someone uh, going to the bathroom a couple of times and then sitting on the couch and you know, eating chips and um, watching TV and you don't see him changing diapers throughout the movie uh, with their family. It just doesn't happen. You also don't, don't see a movie being a third of the whole movie about the main character sleeping. But that would be an accurate uh, life story. So coming to TED, sometimes it may feel the same way. Like you basically come here and you hear all these inspiring stories, you may like meet people, and as you meet people, they tell you like this 30-second elevator pitch of their new edgy business idea. And then after hearing all these stories and meeting all these people, then you still need to go home. And Monday you need to go to the office. And then suddenly your story actually may not seem that fresh anymore. The elevator pitch of our organization, uh, Empower Asia, kind of like sounds the same, same way. Uh, we are talking about Empower Asia is an organization that wants to help people and write a better story. So we want to equip young people for life through training and coaching and mentoring. We want to reach the future leaders and innovators of Asia. And as we're helping them to write a better story, we hope that they would be the innovators and, and changers of society of tomorrow. We work on university campuses. And there we meet the, the high potentials of the city. We meet the movers and, and shakers of tomorrow. And that all sounds really interesting. It sounds like a great story. But really, how does the everyday routine look like? Not that elevator pitch that you hear if you just you know, maybe meet me for an hour for a minute, or if you meet someone else that has this new edgy business idea. When you really hear about what's really going on in their lives, in the story, in the business, and that's where our story is pretty different. So there we meet students and they talk about the loneliness that they experience on campus while studying. There we hear them talk about how they have broken family relationships. We hear them talk about worries about the future, what job should I do, and how will I really find my passion in that. We hear them talk about disillusionment, about life. And we talk about depression and suicide. That's really the everyday stories of our routine of meeting students and trying to equip them for, for life and a, and a good life story. I mean, if you think about the average Hong Kong life story, and actually some of you may have experienced the same thing, going to Hong Kong to study and going to university, like, like this is kind of like how it may sound. Countless tutoring hours while going through school, so that with a lot of hard work and maybe a little bit of luck, you get into university. And there you continue studying. Then maybe you get a job. Maybe not in the field that you really want, but it's a job. You live with your parents for maybe another 10 years, working a not that great paying job, maybe like 80, 100 hours a week. 
And then you come to this training point of like being in your 30s, and you can put a down payment on your house, and that's important. Because when you can do that, you may actually get married. And then you have another 30 years ahead trying to pay off that loan um, for, for the house, maybe pay for your parents' retirement. And if you look at that story, it doesn't really sound like really exciting anymore. I want to spend a little bit of my time talking now, the rest of the time that I have, talking about four wise men, uh, people that have something to offer that can help us a little bit on like what, uh, what, we, what we do to write a good story in our lives and how can we help other people write a better story in their lives. So, so the, here they are. So there are four wise, wise men that have something in common. They're all old people. They all have gray hair. So maybe they have a lot of wisdom that they can share with us. And uh, maybe they can tell us a little bit what it means to write a good story. So let's get started with the first of the four men. Jean-François Loitard. You may not remember his picture, but maybe some of you may know the name. Uh, he's the founder, basically, of postmodern thinking. And what he became most famous for is the idea of that nowadays people have what he calls an incredulity towards meta narratives. Well, that modern people, the postmodern people, have this incredulity towards meta narratives. What does it mean? In other words, nowadays people have an increased skepticism toward these grand stories, these overarching stories that try to define life and give the answer uh, to everyone. Maybe the, the grand story of capitalism, of communism, maybe the stories of world religions. So nowadays, more and more people don't really buy into these grand stories and they escape to the smaller local narratives. Um, Hong Kong is kind of like a melting pot or like a crossroad for a lot of these grand stories and small stories um, and people trying to navigate through that and they experience that clash of stories, trying to feel like, what's my name? You saw the, the journalist guy from Rio, if you have been here in the morning, that talked about how all these people were protesting. But everyone was protesting for something different because they didn't really know what it really was that united them because they all had different stories that they were really fighting for. I want to tell you um, a real life story um, just to illustrate my point a little bit. So as you heard already, I, I grew up in, in Germany, uh, worked in private banking. We are England and the US, uh, where I actually studied uh, historical theology and development of thought. I came to Hong Kong to work with university students and come alongside them in their life story. And one of the first people I met in Hong Kong was a student from mainland China. Now he had just arrived here uh, about three weeks, and the story that he was living was one that he didn't write himself. It was a story that his parents and society had written for him that he should go, actually 30 of his relatives put money together to send him here to study. And there were a lot of expectations for him to succeed so that he would ultimately bring honor to his family. He wrestled with that because, because there was another story going on in his, in his family that nobody had ever talked about. His father drank, he was abusive to the family, and he wrestled with this incongruity of all these stories. And then he came to Hong Kong, and there's the story of how to live in the dorms in Hong Kong. There's this like, student culture there, and all these other expectations of being a student here in the city. And so he shared with me and said, I don't know where to head. And I have slipped into deep depression. And you, you may be the last person I will ever talk to. And that was one of the first encounters I had with the student. Now, his story went, took, a, took a very positive turn later on, but that's not really the story that I want to tell. But what I want to show you is that confusion in that clash of all these big and small narratives that people are trying to wrestle through. And moving on towards an answer, I want to actually consult the, the second guy. Sigmund Freud, um, Austrian uh, thinker, founder of psychoanalysis, and if you listen to his voice on what our brain story is all about, it would sound a little bit like this. What decides the purpose of life is simply the program of the pleasure principle. 
So the purpose of life of Freud is, uh, he's talked about that pleasure principle. The pleasure principle basically uh, says if we seek immediate uh, fulfillment of our needs, then our body will return um, this, um, uh, us with that feeling of, of pleasure. So it's basically the idea that a uh, life lived well uh, is kind of what you're going for, and the primary goal is to seek uh, pleasure. Whether that, that pleasure may be uh, sex or your success and you know, the titles on the business card, uh, mm -hmm. your achievements and feeling that sense of accomplishment, drugs, in a way anything that actually pleasure derives from. The other element of what Freud talks about is the unpleasure principle. Sometimes it's not really pleasure that's in the forefront of one, but it's, it's pain. And so when pain enters our life and suffering enters our lives, and we may not be so much concerned about finding pleasure, but avoiding unpleasure. So in a way, that grand story that Freud kind of talks about is that battle between like, finding and seeking our pleasure and avoiding uh, unpleasure. But I think that despite him enjoying like, his with his cigar, the pleasures of life, he looks, looks a little bit grumpy. Um, so maybe, maybe his grand story isn't working that great. I don't want to, want to, want to uh, reject that because of that, but I think the next guy that we have on our list um, will be able to add a, another dimension. So the third guy I want to talk about is uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, Frankl, um, also an Austrian uh, thinker, while, while Freud was the founder of the first Vienna School of Psychoanalysis, uh, Frankl is the, the founder of the third Vienna School of Psychoanalysis. So they knew each other, they wrestled with thought, and he disagreed on a, a certain aspect with, with Freud. Actually, Frankl's story is one of a lot of unpleasure. Uh, growing up you know, in the 1900s, uh, being an Austrian uh, Jew, he actually was uh, placed in a concentration camp. And for six years, he was in that concentration camp. And uh, his wife and his parents actually died there, but he survived, and he was facing the reality of no one uh, will welcome me when I come back. So that was the one side. On the other side, he was actually also uh, working with, uh, with patients, with thousands of patients that dealt with depression and with suicidal ten tendencies. And, and his results in his uh, professional life, um, uh, during uh, his time working uh, with patients, but also in his personal experience in the concentration camp, he actually uh, shaped what is called logotherapy. Local therapy is basically, in other words, meaning therapy. So while uh, Freud talks about the purpose of life in, in seeking all pleasure, waiting on pleasure, he basically uh, says, no, it's, it's about finding meaning in life and what we do. The only reason that, that we may get, uh, get folks on the other side is when we don't have meaning in our lives or there are obstacles along the way that actually distract us. And then we distract ourselves with finding pleasure. So if we don't have a story of meaning, or we have a, have a blockage of an obstacle on the way to a story of meaning, then we will turn to pleasure to satisfy and find an alternative. Um, one of the big things that I think comes out here is that Franklin way highlights that you can run away from conflict. You heard a little bit of uh, what Gregory Slayton said about failure, how transformative and shaping a failure really can be for us. When, when Frankl puts it in, in words, he says, For too long uh, we have been dreaming a dream from which we are now waking up. The dream that if we just improve the socioeconomic situation of people, everything will be okay, people will be happy. The truth is that as the, the struggle for survival has subsided, the question emerged, survival for what? Ever more people today have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. Franklin concluded that the paramount existential stress today is a lack of meaning. We're basically facing a crisis of, of meaninglessness. Um, people often run the, the course of life in the, in the fastest possible, uh, possible way so that they don't see how aimless or meaningless uh, our life is. So his great story that he offers is a story of meaning. And at Asia, our um, organization, uh, we agree with, with what Frankl has to offer. Uh, we believe a good story is really rooted in a life that actually is based on finding meaning. A good story uh, embraces uh, conflict, 
doesn't run away from it, and uh, doesn't just uh, look for seeking pleasure. But then in the beginning, I want to just talk about what a good con uh, story constitutes, but also uh, how we can actually come alongside young people in writing a better story. Uh, so with the Asia, one of the things that we do a lot is mentorship, and we believe that mentorship is one of the key areas on how helping young people to write a better, better story. And how we're defining a mentor is actually a story guide. So someone who comes alongside a young person and listens to their story, walks along to their story, shares about their life experience, and steps them on the course of actually figuring out what is the story that I ultimately need to live. And this needs to be a story of meaning. So in closing, I want to, I want to consult our uh, final old person with gray hair, Gandalf the White. Um, Gandalf, he served as a great mentor to Frodo, to his friends. Uh, he helped them to figure out their place in their story, that grand story of Middle Earth. And he set them on the course and he walks uh, with them. And as he does that, at one point, Gandalf says these words. Indeed, we are now a good deal further than I meant to come with you. For after all, this is not my adventure. A good mentor helps a young person discover their purpose, set them on the, on, on the right track, equip them with the right tools, and as they are ready, then he finds that right moment so that they can continue their own life story. And before I travel too far east with you, I want to let you basically end that place of saying, what is your life story? What is that story? What, what is it that you derive meaning from? Because that will and will prepare you to be a mentor for someone. And that's really what we are all about in Power Asia and what we believe this city needs. People that pass on their experience, come alongside people, and help them to figure out their place in their life story, to set the course in the right track, but at the right moment, leave them empowered to move on, to live a life of innovation, of finding out their purpose, and live a life of meaning. Thank you.